Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, along with my wonderful wife, Janet, and we are streaming live from the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy Studio. And I'm super excited to have our guest on today. You don't want to miss out because he is from, actually co-founder of Wellbridge Surgical Center in Indiana, and it is another um, free market surgery center. If you guys follow us often, we talk about the surgery center of Oklahoma and Dr. Keith Smith, who since 19, 1997 has been, has had a surgery center where they got out of the traditional healthcare racket and offer patients a big savings by paying directly. So we have Dr. Panekion, who is an anesthesiologist and the co-founder of Wellbridge Surgical. And we are going to learn about their store today and, and how they can save people money and how they are better quality and a lower price and yet better service. I know we talk about it often in free market medicine and we talk about it often in, in just um, services in general that you can usually have three of the two. You can have low price, um, high quality and good service. And you can usually have two of those three. Well, let me tell you this, in free market medicine, you can have all three of those um, if you choose to pay directly. And Dr. Panecki is going to show us how today. So, Dr. Panecki, welcome to our show. Thank you. And, yeah, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your story. I, I think you guys have been open for a couple months now. And just tell us about, um, about that journey and, and what brought you into opening up a free market um, surgery center. Yeah, sure. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it all started probably about four and a half, five years ago. Um, I was introduced to the Free Market Medical Association, the FMMA, and at that time, um, or shortly thereafter, the subsequent year, went to one of the conferences and met uh, Dr. Keith Smith. And um, the impetus for doing that in the first place was, you know, I'd spent about 10, 11 years in medicine by that point in practice and realized that you know, the trajectory that we were on was non-sustainable. Um, and really, um, I was getting less and less kind of enamored or um, less enjoyment from the actual practice of medicine, because, you know, as you start to learn about the, the business of medicine and how the process happens and the, the, the patient experience, um, the cost, um, the pressures applied to patients um, with time constraints on medicine, you realize that the system's fundamentally broken. And so I didn't really know what the solution was until I started doing a little research on, you know, the free market medicine kind of drive or um, ideals. And so Keith Smith obviously was up and running at that point in time. And um, his surgery center was was very successful. And he talked quite a bit to both myself and Dr. Inman, who's a, also a co-founder of the business, about how he did it. And um, it really kind of lit a fire in us that, um, you know, there is a way that we can practice medicine the way that it should be. Um, and what I mean by that is um, no longer limiting accessibility to care. And when I say limiting accessibility, not just financial, obviously that's a huge hurdle and that's one that we're, we're, we're striving to solve. And I think we're, we're starting to already by decreasing the cost substantially, um, but also by um, just opening up access. So patients have a, a, a portal, a, a phone number where they can reach out directly to us. They're not put in a queue from three months from now to see a direct, you know, or to see um, a primary care doc. Uh, we have relationship with direct primary care docs that are willing to see them right away. Um, and surgeons who, who really buy into this as well. So we have a network of medical professionals around us that really allow us to kind of fast track patients through the system and, and explain to them the process along the way not just told, hey, you go here in three months and then wait for the next step. Literally answer their questions, um, listen to them, and get them plugged in to see the specialists that, that they need to see. Well, always in a story of where we end up in the free market, there is something that made you decide like a final straw. I know Sean and I have shared this story. You know, we had a patient that called us and, you know, I, I remember when Patty called and she gave us her goodbye. She actually was passing away. She was morbidly obese and I had taken care of her for many, many years. And I thought in my mind, you know, am I a part of this issue? Am I a part of the broken system? Did I enable her to stay in her lifestyle that really harmed her and put her in the grave? So what what hit you 
to wake up your eyes to say, okay, was it several things or was it just one day? It was just, I'm done. It, it was a, it was a series of events kind of that happened. Um, the first part of it was like I was telling you about um, or alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, you start realizing how medicine, the business of medicine works and patients start feeling the effects. So it was not uncommon that I would get asked by patients, are you a network or can, you know, it, it, will my, will my anesthesiology bill be covered by this hospitalization or in this, um, in this hospitalization or will I have to pay out of network fees? And I said, well, of course, you know, we don't practice any place that we're not currently, you know, a network with from a hospital system standpoint, but I didn't really understand the question so much. And really it was, as I started researching that I found out, you know, patients sometimes are charged exorbitant rates just because of the terms of their, you know, their insurance. And so it wasn't uncommon that, you know, if a patient didn't submit the insurance information properly, that they might get a bill for three times, you know, what the normal reimbursement was for any given procedure. Um, so, so those kind of things happen regularly. Um, multiple times patients have said to me, um, Hey, um, I know I'm just a number and, and I, I, I really didn't know how to respond to that. You know, why would you think that? And, you know, you're not just a number, you know, you're an individual, you're a person that, that, that matters. And, you know, as most medical professionals will tell you, when you go into the field, you, you know, whichever specialty you choose, you know, the idea is you're taking care of people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to be able to, to say that, you know, I, you know, I have one patient at a time and feel the anesthesiology and you're my sole focus. Um, and I, I tell pa patients that all the time. I said, um, I love the field because I get to focus on one patient. I'm involved very detailed in a very detailed manner in your care. And my goal is to get you through this safely um, and as comfortably as possible and um, with with the best outcomes. And so so those things happen. And then, you know, it was incremental issues with the hospital systems that 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 I worked in. Um, it used to be that we could practice um, evidence-based medicine, um, and that slowly got eroded by cost factors. Um, a lot of the hospital systems no longer really wanted to, to, to hear about new medications that have better outcomes in our field because they cost more. Um, some other things that happened, um, we tried to practice conscientious, you know, I would say, in a, you know, our field of uh, conscientious medicine meaning that like certain drugs in certain sizes cost more than other sizes. So we use a common induction drug, propofol, that's used in probably 90 plus percent of surgeries every single day. Uh, they come in multiple vial sizes. It used to be 10 years ago, I could ask a hospital, would a 20 ml vial cost more or less if I use two versus a 50 ml vial? And they would tell me and they'd give me the cost for each of those drugs. And it got to the point where just two years ago, I asked for that same information because prices always change. And um, they said, we're not allowed to disclose that information to you. And I said, well, wow. why is that? I said, my, my goal, I don't benefit from this in any way. I'm just trying to save cost. And uh, they said, well, that's proprietary information um, within our health system. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't disclose that information to you. And so it got to the point where you know, my practice was kind of limited from a diversity of medications. Um, I couldn't choose evidence-based medicine as a as an approach in a lot of situations. And um, but it really wasn't until we actually started the the development of the business that kind of the teeth came out um, of the healthcare systems. Um, we um, we decided to do this, and Dr. Emmon and I. Um, and Jeff Williams, the third partner in the business, opened or actually sorry, purchased the building, started remodeling it and said, you know, we're going to do free market medicine in a surgical sense and offer cash payer prices that are freely advertised and all inclusive that are the same for everyone across individual procedures and across individual medical specialties. Um, and then the, the, the hospital administrators, when the website went live, reached out to us and said that um, you have to cease and desist. And I wow. said, well, wow. I said, I don't, I don't, um, I don't really understand that, but should we at least have a conference, you know, a conference about it, a conversation? So we did. Um, and we met with some of the high level multi-state leadership within the healthcare system that we were currently a part of as a private group. And they said that we don't believe this is consistent with our mission. And I said, well, can you define that? Because 
um, if your mission is to increase accessibility to care um, and decrease costs, then we're 100 percent aligned. Um, and they said, well, we have a system in place for those people who can't afford their care. And, and they choose their words very carefully, you know, and um, I said, well, what does that mean exactly? And they said, if you meet certain criteria, um, and I looked up the criteria and it basically meant if you were truly indigent, um, if you really had no assets, um, you had nothing, then yes, you could apply for basically free healthcare or surgical care. But um, anybody that had any kind of gainful employment, they would put you on a payment plan that basically would handcuff you to 15, 20 years or more of debt um, for a surgical procedure um, that could be done in a, you know, in an hour or two in an, in an outpatient setting. And so our response to that was, you know, um, we are not competing for commercial insurance or government insurance patients. We literally want to increase accessibility to care um, for all patients that otherwise wouldn't have insurance um, or that just didn't have access or couldn't afford the cash payer prices of the current health systems. And we have seven healthcare systems, seven large healthcare uh, systems in our city. And I said, our target obviously isn't to pull patients from any one system, but there's patients from all around the city who either forego care or who are forced to, you know, to pay a price that's actually substantially higher than any insurance reimbursed price for this, for any given procedure. And so we just want to give those patients an option. And um, it just wasn't received well. Um, they said that um, that's not okay. And we, we just don't think that you can continue to do that. Um, and one of the things that, that we said is that, well, you know, we are a private group and we feel that this is something that's a good thing for medicine. And um, the response to that was, well, um, if you're going to continue, then we will leverage, you know, any authority, um, any, any uh, control that we have um, in a financial sense with the larger group that you're a part of um, is really what it pulled down to. And so when it got to that point, um, Dr. Emmett and I both said, you know, I don't want this to financially impact any other partner of the group. Um, we had not broken any contractual um, terms with the hospital. Our privileges had never been in question or revoked. And so we said, you know, I, I think it's just time to step away and um, kind of do the right thing. And yeah, in a nutshell, that's kind of kind of how it played out. Wow. I, it's just amazing. It's just, it seems like to me that um, hospitals just don't like competition and um, you guys are just competition for them. And I think it's amazing too, how you say their wording that, you know, in indigent patients, how they'll give charity care. And I love how hospitals do define charity care. And we, we actually had a former hospital administrator on our show to talk about how hospitals define charity care. And it's a lot different than what most people think. But what's amazing too, is with a lot of commercial insurances now, is, you know, there's deductibles up to $10,000. So there'll be people that'll go in for a, you know, routine surgery that, you know, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And it's, you know, if you, they do it with a, in a, in a, a free market setting, they can pay five or $6,000. And in the hospital, it's $40,000. And then they, have, they end up having to pay $10,000 deductible. So that's an instance where that indigent patient wouldn't really qualify, yet they're out $10,000 anyway, because of the deductible, they would be better off going to a system like yours, correct? I think so. And I can give you like a, a very specific example. You know, we just two weeks ago, I took care of um, two children. Um, it was a family had had two children. One was age two, one was nine months old. Um, and they both needed ear tubes, recurrent otitis, recurrent ear infections. I've uh, been on antibiotics repeatedly and, and were at risk for causing long term hearing issues and damage if they didn't have ear tubes placed, well, they didn't have insurance. And um, so they called us and were interested in our price for having ear tubes done. We did a little homework and we found out that across the seven hospital systems in our city, that the average price within a few percent was about $6,800. That was the cash payer price, $6,800 roughly. Some are a little higher, some are a little lower. 
Um, but they were remarkably similar, like within just a few percent of one another. In fact, some of the prices on some of the procedures are exactly the same, which kind of fascinates me as well. It comes to uh, pricing transparency, like how is that possible um, that mm -hmm. it could be exactly the same amount? Um, but the price was, like I said, about $1,600. Um, we do are able to perform that same procedure um, bilateral myringotomy tubes for $2,380. Um, and so essentially both children got ear tubes placed um, for less than the cost that it would, would have been for, for one child to have it done. They got it done sooner. And, and what's kind of fascinating about, about it is it's actually the same surgeons because many of the private practice surgeon specialists in the city practice at multiple hospital systems um, so those that are not employed or not obligated um, or limited by any non-compete. So they're, they, they're absolutely interested in working at a you know, new surgery center with kind of the goals and, and ideals that we have. And so the same surgeons, um, new facility, better patient accessibility um, and time to surgery. Um, and I think over time, we're going to be able to perform or, or, or to show better outcomes as well um, as we track that data. Now, one thing I, I ask is that when you were, um, we commonly talk about this on our show, um, when you asked the price, did you ask about all exclusivity? Did, did the price of that surgery include the surgeon's fee? Did it include anesthesia? anesthesia? Did it include, you know, imaging if that was involved? Because that's right. how hospitals get you. They, you know, I know when our son broke his leg last year, Five different companies, probably. We had bills from yeah. five different companies. You know, so did you clarify that part um, about was it all inclusive? Was that sixty-eight hundred dollars for that one in a hospital all inclusive? Yeah, that part I, I don't know. Um, it's quite possible that that number could could run higher. Um, it depends on how much you believe the pricing that they post on the website. And I, <laughs> right. I think if you if you poll people that have looked at those numbers and found and then did the math afterwards, they don't always align. But I don't know that for a fact. Um, I just heard kind of secondhand information, but in our case, that $2,380 includes literally everything. It includes the facility fee. It includes the anesthesiologist fee. It includes the surgeon's professional service fee. It includes all disposable costs related to surgery. It includes the pre-op evaluation and it includes any post-op follow-up. And in the event of pathology, it also includes that. Um, so if there's a specimen that's sent to pathology, um, whether that be a gallbladder or whether it be a skin lesion that's sent for analysis or whether that just be a polyp from a colonoscopy, all of that is included. So any price that we have posted is included. Um, there's a few exceptions, um, orthopedic procedures. Sometimes if you get into bigger cases, um, total joint prostheses, um, every patient is a little bit different. So you don't always know exactly what prosthesis is going to be needed. Uh, but even in that case, um, we take the price of the prosthesis that, that we've negotiated with the vendor and include that in the bundle with zero markup. We, we, don't, we don't make money off pathology. We don't make money off of, you know, the prosthesis that's used or the hardware that's, uh, that's implemented for a surgery. Um, the idea is to pass those savings on to the patient. Um, but, but fundamentally, if you don't introduce some kind of competition into the market, we firmly believe, uh, Dr. Emman and I and, and Jeff Williams, our third co-founder, believe that we're on kind of the, a slow march to a single payer system that's probably going to limit accessibility to care Absolutely. even more, um, not to say anything about quality. So um, if we don't try to advance the field and introduce competition and find ways to do things better with better outcomes and better efficiency um, and better quality that... Um, you know, I, I think we're heading in, in a bad direction. And we always use a simple example, you know, most people have accepted healthcare the way that it is, um, but yeah. you would never accept that in any other aspect of your life. You know, <laughs> would you ever go buy a car without knowing what it costs first? And yeah. would you ever accept the fact that that car costs a different amount for a different person just because of their insurance and, you know, and circumstances, and, you know, and everybody's legally allowed to be charged a different price, um, significantly different price. Um, you know, you'd almost say that's discriminatory. Um, and so I, I just fundamentally don't, don't believe that's right. And, um, you know, so, so really we try to build the model to, to prevent those things from happening. 
I think from also from a healthcare provider standpoint, we see patients that um, financially can't afford something, put something off because of the access issue. And right. we were always taught that as soon as you can take care of a, a health issue rather than prolong it, their outcome increases to be more positive because that that issue has been dealt with, uh, you know, i.e. colon cancer. The sooner you find the polyps, the better the outcome for the client. So I think in in a provider stance, you know, as a doctor, a nurse, as a um, pharmacist, you know, we want that patient taken care of in a timely manner because the more time that's there with somebody with some pathology or, or something, the less likely we have to have that positive outcome. And so um, when we are talking about doctors that are doing surgeries and performing them throughout your whole community at different entities, if we all had the same outlook, i.e. the hospitals, the surgical centers, you know, if we all had the, the patient is our focus to get the health and the wellness for that client versus fighting over the scraps there, because really you're taking care of clients that are not able to access them and they're not able to get the care that they need. And so, you know, it's kind of ironic that we're sitting here talking about, you know, um, you know, they, they have to wait for three months and then they have to wait for another thing. And, you know, and in that time frame, how long is it before they actually have that procedure that they needed? Right. That's absolutely true. So do you, I, speaking of that, um, can you give an example? And I, I, I'm putting you on the spot and you're, you might not be prepared for this. And I'm not sure how much, um, you know, being an anesthesia that you might or might not know about this. But can you give an example of, you know, a patient that when you were in the system um, had to wait weeks or months to get a procedure done, um, whereas you guys increase access? I mean, you already talked about the about the um the two kids with uh tubes maybe you can explain their system a little bit and what kind of i imagine they tried to access the traditional system first maybe not and if they did what kind of run around did they get and what would their time frame have been been and what was yours compared to that yeah i can give you a couple situations um and some of them run together um so i don't know if necessarily the insurance situation is the same for each of these cases, but they fall into two categories. Um, you have the patients that don't have insurance um, and they just need some type of surgical care in the case of ear tubes or, or whatever that might be, um, you know, an ear tube or colonoscopy or hernia repair, or gallbladder removal. Um, they fall into two camps. One is the camp of, I, you know, I just don't have insurance. And I need to get this done. I'm willing to pay for it, but I just cannot afford, in the case of uh, gallbladder, lap coli, one hour procedure with about an hour recovery um, that involves a couple small one and a half centimeter incisions. Um, that cost is $22,000. Well, I say that cost, that is the after negotiated discounts, the reimbursement rate to the hospital for that procedure. Two hours of facility time, an hour of surgery and maybe an hour of recovery for $22,000. Our cost is eighty some eighty three hundred dollars, eighty four hundred dollars for that same procedure, um, and so the patient can't afford twenty two thousand, frankly. So they just deal with gallstones, and eventually they end up getting you know gallstone pancreatitis or other complications related to it. Um, and so that's camp one. Camp two is the people who know that they have health insurance; they pay for it every month. They are relatively healthy families, and they don't utilize it. They say, hey, I'm paying $1,000 or more a month for a family plan, and I have an $8,000 family deductible. I go see my PCP when I can get in, and I use up maybe 5 to 10% of my deductible every year. It's now November, and I need surgery, you know, um, and so I need a hernia repair. Well, in that situation, if they have an $8,000 deductible, that hernia surgery is going to eat up literally every single dollar of that $8,000 and then some, you know, in the current health systems. So they're going to pay almost $8,000 out of pocket. Um, in our case, I think most of the, depending on the type of hernia, they're going to save three, sometimes $4,000 off that, that number. So they might choose in November, December to pay $5,500 at Wellbridge, knowing that their deductible is going to reset in January anyway. Right. And so they just save themselves $3,000. They know that they're unlikely to need another surgery in the next few weeks. 
And uh, even if in that scenario, you're really functioning kind of out of network, but it only makes sense to do so because they've looked at the numbers and they've, you know, kind of realized that I don't utilize my healthcare plan and I don't want to because it actually is not really providing the needs for the needs that I have, you know? Right. Now, can you talk about how quick you can get somebody in as opposed to if they were going through traditional insurance, they need prior authorization for surgery and all that kind of stuff. How quick can Wellbridge get somebody in after the referral process and, and all that from a primary care? I know that's, it's a case by case basis, but can you give an example? Right. It's, it's tough. I, like right now, it's hard for me to say because we're between Christmas and New Year's. But let's say we fast forward a week and a half and it's first week of January, usually within um, within a week. Um, right. And that's that's usually a week to surgery. Um, at least we have the capability of doing that right now. Um, and oftentimes the surgeons um, that we've partnered with will will kind of make exceptional you know, block time available or, you know, go the extra mile to try to get these patients in because we found that most, most healthcare providers want patients to have accessibility to care, but they're forced to operate within the insurance prior authorization system. And when we just come to them and say, Hey, we have a patient, they're a cash payer. Can you get them in or find a way to make this work? Usually the answer is yes. So usually within days to a week or so. I love it. I mean, and the fact, Dr. Panicki, that you even had to say the part about you know, well, we, because we're between holidays and all that, the fact that you're even thinking about a week, I mean, hospital systems, it's months out. Let, let's mm-hmm. face it. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, I could tell that you were going to be able to get in, in faster than most hospitals. Now, here's another thing, a question that I have for you. So how does it feel being liberated from the system? How does that make you feel as a doctor? Um, I appreciate you asking that question because um, I, I think that's really what drives most of what I'm doing. Um, and I, I, like I said, I, I don't—I hate to speak for Dr. Emmings; he's not here, but I, I know that he feels the same way because we've had this conversation. Um, it is somewhat daunting. It is somewhat uh, very stressful at times, um, but it is extremely rewarding. And um, what I mean by that is most people, most physicians, most—I would, I would say maybe even people that. Um, our, you know, pharmacy may think this way and physical therapists may think this way. You spend a lot of time in school. And one of the things that is nice about the field of medicine is that there is job security. Um, you know that you will be in need, you know, that you have a unique skill set that's, um, patients are going to require. And it's, it's nice to know that that is, um, is something that you can kind of hang your hat on. Um, when, kind of going out on a, on a, on a venture like this, you are giving up that security. Um, but you feel like you're doing the right thing. At least I feel like I'm doing the right thing. Um, you know, it, it, every patient that, that comes through here that, that, that kind of smiles and says, how is it so easy here? Uh, just, just kind of re reaffirms what we're doing. Um, that, that, that patient, those two patients that I mentioned earlier, um, the two children and family, they literally posted on Facebook an hour after leaving here about how happy they were about their experience. Um, and like I said, we didn't ask anybody to do that. That's just something they elected to do. And so they put a post up for everyone to see to, to just to talk about how, how nice it was to, to, to be able to get through a system, have your questions answered and go through a stressful time with people that's that really care and um, make healthcare easy for them. I love it. And I'm not surprised. I can tell you being the, you know, the father of, of, of two grown boys now, um, I know that my wife would have been ecstatic to have some kind of service like that for, for our two kids. Um, our latest experience with the hospital with our son when he was 18 years old was not very good. Not surprised, but it wasn't very good. Um, expensive, poor service, um, quality. Eh. Um, but you know, we want to educate and empower others that there is something something different out there. And even if you have traditional health insurance, there's something different out there. Doctors like yourself that have stepped out of the box. And I will tell you that for me as a pharmacist, Jan and I have not billed traditional insurance or insurance at all since 2002. So we've almost been doing free market medicine for 20 years. And I will tell you, it was either we got out of pharmacy because we did not like what was going on, 
we changed professions or we did something different and we love what we do. And yeah, it was scary. And at first it really, it's still maybe we've been doing it 20 years. So secure, we got a lot of security now, but you're right. That's why a lot of physicians or healthcare professionals don't get out of the traditional system because it's super secure and, and they're scared. But I got asked one time in Oklahoma when we went to the Free Market Medical Association Oklahoma chapter meeting, somebody asked me about, um, you know, survival versus thriving. And, you know, we're, we're thriving. But I will say that to me, it doesn't matter because I will never, you could not pay me enough to literally to go. I'm in a different place in my career now, but you could not pay me enough to go back to the traditional healthcare setting. Literally, you could not pay Janet and I enough because we are liberated. We feel liberated from the traditional healthcare system. And we have colleagues that work in pharmacy that absolutely despise it, whether they work in a hospital system or they work in a retail system because they have no control over their own over their own um, job. And, and you as a physician know how that is when you work in those systems. Here, you're the most educated professional in the nation, yet you have very little control over what drug you can use as an anesthesiologist, right? It's true. And, and, and again, I, I, I try not to focus on the negative, but, but when you practice in an environment like you're, you're kind of talking about and been a part of something, you realize that you start to realize that you're perceived as a disposable part of the system. Um, meaning, you know, it doesn't matter how educated you are. It doesn't matter really even how talented you are. Um, if you don't, fit the system and do things kind of the way that, that the system is asking you to, to, to operate that um, they'll, they'll, they'll find someone else with your credentials to kind of plug you in almost like a cog in the, in, in the, in a, in a complex piece of machinery. And it was frustrating because um, these are patients that we're taking care of. You know, it's not like you're stamping out, you know, sheet metal or, or, or making parts that, that are, that are, you know, inanimate objects. These are actually people's lives. And when I'm trying to make good decisions that, that, that really impact their outcomes, you know, when you're told that it costs too much or that, you know, that's not something that, that we think we want to do as a, as an entity because of various reasons, they don't even define those reasons. You know, you realize that, Hey, this isn't medicine, at least the way that I understood it to be practiced. Um, right. And so just, you know, it's time for change. So a couple other questions. You got onto the pricing about, I don't remember if you used the number 40%, but um, one of the things you said is how your price could change, would be about 40% less based on the already discounted price from the insurance company. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, even though it's inc in incredibly difficult, which is exactly what hospitals mm -hmm. want, but can you explain that if you're a cash patient going into a hospital, you don't get that insurance discount already. So you'll be paying more already. So your savings is going to be probably eight times what it would norm, what the normal cash price would be at a hospital. Can you explain that? Sure. Um, I can give you a, another example that, that may, may kind of outline that pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty well. Um, so in Indiana, especially Northern Indiana, we have a large population of Amish and Mennonite folks. Um, those people, um, when they have surgical needs, they will come usually to Indianapolis because depending on the surgical needs, I mean, there's multiple hospitals outside the city, but if it's a larger type surgery, you know, Indianapolis is the biggest city in the state and it's kind of a, kind of the focal point, the, the hub of, of that, that wagon wheel of, of healthcare, um, it's tertiary referral centers and whatnot. Um, so oftentimes, you know, if it was a larger orthopedic type procedure, whatever that was, whatever case it was, um, the Amish families would come to Indy and I could probably recount at least five or six times in the last few years um, of individuals come down and a child needs some type of orthopedic procedure for either a fracture or, you know, Achilles tendon lengthening and, you know, in a younger child or, you know, some type of, um, you know, orthopedic spine procedure. Um, and in those cases, the families pay for those out of, out of pocket. And when I say the family, it is like the entire community supports one another yeah. um, in, in those surgical procedures. And so I'll give you an example um, for, you know, in an adult surgery case, I think I told you the gallbladder removal is about $22,000 in the city. That is the amount that the insurance company on average pays after negotiated discounts. 
as anyone that's ever looked at a hospital bill and tried to make sense of it realizes that there's usually a much larger number that's listed above that line item. And it usually is something that's maybe 50, 60, 80% higher. So you'll see a number like 38 or $45,000. And then it'll have a bunch of kind of terminology below and about negotiated discount and in network and, and a bunch of other, you know, kind of arcane terms that will amount to a total that's about 22,000. So if an insurance if an insurance company, a commercial insurance company is paying 22,000 for that procedure, that Amish patient might be paying somewhere in that 38 to 45,000 dollar range um, because the cash payer price while hospitals will oftentimes give you a 5 or 10% discount, you don't have the benefit of those negotiated um, terms that the insurance companies have. And so now the cash payer who happens to be 20, 30, 40 Amish families that are contributing everything they can for an expensive surgery um, are forced to pay even more, you know, than an, an insurance, a commercial insurance reimbursement would be for a patient that has commercial insurance. And in that situation, like I said earlier, our cost is $8,500 more or less for that same procedure. So, you know, how is that fair? It, it's just not. And and they don't, you know, the, the, that patient population, the Amish are wonderful people and um, they, they do not complain. They are hard workers and they're just, they're very thankful for everyone who's cared, you know, when they care for them. I, I just, I see a situation where they're the most gracefully, you know, great, you know, gracious people. And I feel like maybe the ones that are some of the most abused in the current system and no one is making any effort to, to try to correct that, that injustice. Well, you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it's amazing that it's legal. I mean, I think what these mm-hmm. healthcare systems do is they're, they're cartel-like tactics. I mean, they are, collude with insurance companies to basically screw over everybody by, besides somebody that's not insured. And they cost shift, and you, we would not, not accept it in any other industry, yet we do in healthcare. It's just normal. Right, right. I, I, I totally agree. Um, the system now is, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business that um, some of these healthcare entities, um, one of them is a $7 billion revenue company. Another one in our city is a $26 billion a year revenue company. And, and I don't fault them for being large and, and successful. Um, but, but when I'm, you know, you're as a clinician, you're on the ground level like delivering the care you see all these people that are being hurt by the system um financially um rather than being helped you realize that like i said the system is broken and and we see this as a very um straightforward way to 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 kind of increase that fairness right i agree and i had a direct primary care doctor that i interviewed um, last year, I believe, and he said that he thought the only way to fix the system was to get out of the system. That's kind of what you've done, Dr. Panecki, and I and I appreciate you for doing that because you are, you know, leading a revolution in free market medicine. And there, it's not, it's not a flash in the pan. Um, I think it's the future of of medicine. Unfortunately, I think we'll always have government medicine somewhere, but I want, I do think that. In this country, we are always going to have people that are going to be able to make choices with their medicine, um, choices, whether it be surgery, whether it be medication, or whether it be what doctor they choose. And um, you're leading that. So thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate it. Yeah, like I said, it's just the the ability to to, to hear from patients on a one, one-on-one basis and um, individual basis on how um, they had the option you know, and how they had the access and, and how, you know, we save them $5,000 or $8,000, you know, and, you know, over what their cost would otherwise be just kind of, kind of adds fuel to, to, to my, to, to my fire, you know, to kind of keep pushing forward with the, the ideals and, and the goals here. For sure. Now, what is your ultimate patient at um, Wellbridge? Is it a direct cash pay patient? Are you looking for self-funded employer plans? Both? Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, the model was kind of built up on the idea that, you know, hey, anybody who needs surgery, surgery who otherwise can't afford it, we want to give them an alternative that makes no compromises in quality. In fact, is probably better quality from the facility side um, and a practitioner side. 
Um, but, um, but it was basically built around the idea that like these individual folks, whether that be a cash payer that doesn't have insurance or whether that be a super high deductible plan who doesn't utilize their insurance um, and effectively is a cash payer any given year for simple outpatient procedures. Um, that's kind of how we, we built the model. But as we kind of learned more and expanded upon it, we realized that, you know, they're in the state of Indiana, about 70% of companies are self-funded. And basically what that means is that while they have access to the commercial insurance networks, the companies themselves actually pay the claims. So they, they, they basically carry the, the cost associated with that care. And um, with that kind of number, 70%, it only stands to reason that these companies, if they have an outlet um, to be able to find quality care for a much lower cost, it only makes you know, rational sense to, to be a part of that. And so uh, one of the things that we think is very important is to engage with those, those companies to try to give them accessibility to the, the, same, the same programs, the same pricing that, that, that we do for individuals. And one of the, the, the tenets of that is that, you know, we, we don't negotiate volume discounts. Um, we try to drive our price as low as we possibly can, um, and everyone pays the same price. Um, and so whether that's a company that has 10,000 employees and maybe sending us 150 or 200 referrals a year, or whether that's an individual um, mom with a child who comes in and says, hey, I just need ear tubes, um, it's $2,380. Um, and... So we, we just drive that price as low as we can. And we say, hey, look, this is, in that case, probably 65% less than what the going rate is um, in the market at large. I love it. One of the things I like about um, your model, too, is that everybody pays the same price. Now, not only is that, I think, more fair, especially when it comes to healthcare, where there is such a range of pricing, depending on you know, what insurance you have, um, but I think it makes it transparent and simpler for everybody and and you know especially the patients um but also you know even your staff and people that are accessing accessing your services it's just easy to know that's 2380 bucks you know right there's no there's no surprises there, it's all transparent it's pretty easy and i think you know that's one big selling point of your surgery center is here's the price it's that simple you can quote that to somebody it's it is what it is right Right. Yeah. And, and, and we just try to make the whole process easy for them too. you know, one of the things that's under development is a patient portal. Um, so uh, patients will be able to go online. They'll be able to see um, not only information about us individuals, the, those that started the business, but but about the surgeons that will be up um, relatively soon with surgeon bios. And um, the patient portal also will include a payment portal. So if patients want to make payments online, they can do that. Um, and so, you know, it, you don't have to go through all the, the rigorous and confusing steps of submitting claims and getting approval. It's just as simple as any other purchase you'd make. I mean, you look at right. companies like Amazon, right? There's no reason why we can't employ these same type of techniques in healthcare. I agree. So. I agree. We, we are streaming your website right now. It looks like a great website. And so that's uh, where um, people that are interested could, could find out about you, I'm assuming, correct? That's the best way. Absolutely, yeah. And if you want to, you can click on that pricing there to to make sure yeah. I'm quoting you correct numbers because that's <laughs> some of them I memorize, some of them I don't. But um, but like yeah. I said, we I, we truly want to be transparent. There, there's anybody can see these, including the hospital and any other competitors that we would possibly have. But um, but yeah, you literally can um see there. Um, there's the price for the BMTs, um, twenty three eighty. So I got that one right at least. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome you know that you know i got to tell a quick story so um you know, as you know now dr panicki if you call you know your average doctor that works at a hospital type system and you ask them the price for something the first thing they're going to ask you is that they have no clue and even their staff right. is not going to have a clue and i and i think the doctor not having a clue is a problem. I, you know, a lot of yes. doctors say, well, I don't want to know about pricing. And I know pharmacists hide behind that too. And I was actually taught in pharmacy school that we should have to worry about prices. Well, it's just reality. We should have to worry about prices and, mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. And then the patients will get better service that way. Um, when I first got out of pharmacy school, there was no Medicare part D pricing or um, there was no Medicare part D coverage yet. So, so um, there was no drug coverage for seniors yet. 
So pharmacies had to be ultra, ultra competitive with pricing. Mm -hmm. I worked for a retail pharmacy right out of school and all the retail pharmacies were ultra, ultra competitive because they had to be. Um, and then Medicare Part D came into play in 2007. I wasn't, I wasn't playing their games anymore. So I wasn't there, but the minute Medicare, the year Medicare Part D came into effect, drug pricing went up 19% one year. And that should be a clue to a lot of people what goes on when insurance companies, especially the government gets involved. And then now you call an average pharmacy and you ask them the price of medication. They have no idea. They have no idea. And they say, well, it depends on what your insurance. No, you didn't hear me. I don't have insurance. I'm paying cash. Well, we don't really know. And it's like, I think doctors and pharmacists should know the prices of services. That's just, that's just reality. Right. Right. Yeah, actually, that's I mean, that, and that's that's kind of a, a risk with our business model. And, you know, that you have to kind of know the business of medicine. Um, you have to know what it costs to deliver care. And, and just so operating on a patient, obviously, a very complex process and a very high tech building, you know, with high tech equipment. But you have to think about that. You know, you, what, what does, you know, a four by four dressing cost? You know, what does a sling cost? I mean, all those has got all those things have to be accounted for when you're delivering that care. So, yeah, you have to be intimately uh, knowledgeable about right. about all that, you know, to 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 make sure that you want to be fair to the patient. Um, and my goal personally is to drive the prices as absolutely low as I can um, just to demonstrate to patients as well. And Dr. Keith Smith talks about this, that like, hey, this care can be delivered. Surgery is expensive. It is not nearly as expensive as what you've been paying. That's right. um, so, so, and, and I, I, we try our best to actually prove that in the pricing model. And, and we're kind of challenging people by putting it out there like, hey, you don't have to call to get our prices. Just go on the website. You can see right. most, there's over 300 CPTs built out and there'll be a couple hundred more over the next coming months as we add procedures as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you for being on, um, Dr. Panecki. Our our goal at, at Health Solutions is to educate and empower um, people to take charge of their own health. And part of that is financial. That's the only way it's going to fix the system. And I believe it's going to be from the bottom up. Empower patients to make their own healthcare choices. Um, and you're, you're part of that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. And I appreciate you, um, you know, having an interest in and hearing about our model and yeah, we look forward to, to future conversations. Yeah. So as we wrap this show up, uh, what do you have a passion for? Um, my hobbies are pretty varied. Um, if you're talking about personal hobbies outside of medicine, I just got back yeah. um, two days ago from Disney. Um, I promised my family when we started this business venture, you know, the modeling for four and a half years, five years ago, the actual physical purchase and building of the building um, about two years ago, um, we haven't done much in the way of vacations. So, um, you know, my, my wife and, and I, and I have two kids, we, we enjoy traveling. So Disney was our, our trip of choice. Awesome. Um, this go around. So, uh, I do enjoy that. I, I do a little bit of, uh, working in the garage, a little woodworking. I have, you know, some varied hot, varied hobbies and, you know, I have a little home theater in the basement at my home that I like to tweak on and work on. Oh, I love that. We'll have to we'll have to discuss our home theaters. I I, I love music. I'm an audiophile, and I love my home. Same. Theater. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was. I, I say it's my little getaway. <laughs> yeah. So I was making a joke to one of my friends who's a musician, and he knows music, and we talk music sometimes, and he talks like guitars and gear and stuff. And I talk uh, stereo equipment and I sent right. him a, a, a text. I said, if you're, if you're waiting for any last minute Christmas, <laughs> Christmas uh, shopping ideas for me, um, here's a, a fully decked out Macintosh home theater that you could buy for me. <laughs> there you go. There you <laughs> right? go. Yep. And it was like $400,000, you know, just in equipment. <laughs> <laughs> I so, can and, believe it. Yeah. He didn't take me too seriously. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, no, I appreciate you being on and you've definitely realized our goal today. And yeah, let's stay in touch because I want to um, keep in touch with you and see how your surgery center goes uh, as, as you guys progress. So thanks for being on today, Dr. Panecki. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you for listening to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Yeah.